evening, everyone. Um, thank you for all showing up. I am Marsha. I am one of the founders of the Brooklyn Caribbean Literary Festival. And we are the little engine that could. Katia Ulysses, um, that's what she called us. We're uh, an organization devoted to showcasing the beauty and the wonder of Caribbean literature. We're Brooklyn-based and we're going into our fourth year. Um, the work that we do is heavily predicated on relationships like the one that we have with the Center for Fiction. Um, Elizabeth is Dr. Nunes. She is also the namesake of one of our awards. One of the ways that we try to showcase Caribbean writers is by creating a conduit and a pipeline for Caribbean writing. Um, and we have two annual awards, of which Elizabeth is the namesake. We have an annual festival and just a bunch of ongoing programs, some podcasts, etc. cetera. Um, this tonight means a lot to us. This is the first book that Elizabeth has launched since we have um, started this journey as a festival. And I'm extremely honored to introduce her and her host this evening. Elizabeth Nunez is the award-winning author of a memoir and 10 novels, four of them selected as New York Times Editor's Choices. Anna, in between, won the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award and was long listed for an IMPAC Impact Dublin International Literary Award. She also re received the 2015 Hurston Wright Legacy Award in Nonfiction for Not for Everyday Use, an American Book Award, and a Nallis Lifetime Literary Award from Trinidad and Tobago, um, from their National Library. She's a co-founder of the National Black Writers Conference and executive producer of the CUNY TV series, Black Writers in America. She is a distinguished professor at Hunter College where she teaches fiction writing. Elizabeth divides her time between Amityville and Brooklyn, New York. Crystal Bob Semple is Elizabeth's um, conversation partner this evening, and she's the founder and CEO of Plato Learning, a literacy-based summer camp company with locations nationwide. Her programs use cultural mythologies to build reading interest and skills for more than 8,000 children each year. From 2000 to 2010, she was the owner and operator of Brownstone Books, an independent bookstore in bed known for revitalizing and embracing the literary scene in Brooklyn. Crystal has served on the board of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation and is trustee at the St. Anne School. A graduate of Hampton University, she holds an MPA from the University of Delaware and a doctorate in education and organization leadership from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I would invite you to join me in putting our hands together to welcome them both on stage as we experience now Lila knows. Wow. Okay. Did you turn yours? <laughs> I turned mine on. Can you hear me? Is that good? Can I just ask everyone to give another round of applause to <laughs> the fabulous Elizabeth Nunez? It is always a pleasure to be in conversation with Elizabeth. She is a champion of literacy. She's a champion of mine. Um, those of you who uh, are here, I'm sure, understand the importance of literature and bookstores and independent voices. And Elizabeth is the person who, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little emotional. A lot of people don't know that um, Elizabeth inspired me when I had the bookstore. She was the one person who was constantly pushing me to think about the work that I was doing there, but also in a larger context. Um, by that, I mean to understand that it wasn't just a brick and mortar space, which I know that I knew. 
it was a place where people could tell their stories and bring themselves to life. And certainly in the books that she's written over the course of her career, she has done that for all of us. In addition, Elizabeth was the first writer to host a writing workshop at our, at our store. Yeah. And out of that workshop, you know, she showed once again that not only is it important for us to be readers and tellers of our own truth, but keepers of the craft. Um, and when it comes to the work of literature, the craft of writing, uh, Elizabeth is in a class by herself. Um, I see members of our writing group here tonight, and um, we've, we've struggled to do what she just does so effortlessly. I mean, we laugh because every time we turn around, Elizabeth is like, I wrote another book, and I'm working on another one, and another one is published. And so that inspiration, um, it just means so, so much. Um, I like to repeat words that you've given us all the time. And, you know, writers write. Writers write. And so for those of you who are already writers in the audience, for those of you who are aspiring, you know, we have such a, a, a model here in Elizabeth. So, well, thank you, Krista. <laughs> that was amazing. This, this is an incredible woman. Um, you've heard what Marsha has said about her. And I have watched Crystal grow and grow and grow. And, and um, her mother is here, Carol. Mm -hmm. And I remember from in that bookstore when your son was a little toddler trying to work his way through those books, um, you know, crawling on his four hands <laughs> and knees. Yeah. So, you know, this is a sort of a family situation. And thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank you for the Center for Fiction for hosting this. And I have to give a special thanks to my publisher, Johnny Temple. Um, those of you who know Akashic Books know that Akashic Books is the publishing house that saves so much of us. Um, meaning that, um, not to get on my soapbox, but that so much of publishing veers toward what is commercially viable. And Johnny has always been the keeper <laughs> the keeper of our stories, the keeper of our values, the keeper of our visions. And sometimes I go up to him and I say, but Johnny, I, I, is this coming out on the black on your side? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Is this working out? Don't worry about it, Elizabeth. Don't worry about it. But um, so I want to thank Johnny very much. Um, he's been the publisher of my last four books, four or five, four. How many, Johnny? Five, yes, the publisher of my last five books. Yeah. Um, so I am very grateful to him and to all of you for being here and absolutely for Marsha, for the Brooklyn Caribbean Literary Festival who's been a champion and a team of incredible women. Um, so if there's anybody I left that out, and of course the people in my workshop that COVID stopped. Yeah, I miss you. Yeah. Um, but here we are. Here we are. So, and yeah. COVID has only given us more to write about. We've That's got right. so many, so many stories. We've got so, yeah. uh, so much that we've endured and that we understand differently because of the, the moments that we've, we've yeah. lived. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this book is an example of that. Everything you write is timely and purposeful, which means it's connected to the now. The now. Um, so, you know, I've read the story and mm -hmm. I know all the ways in which uh, Lila, a Caribbean, um, a Caribbean woman, mm -hmm. comes to America and comes to understand herself, America, her place in it, and also things from, from back home. But tell us, why did you write this book? Well, maybe I could come to the end, Crystal, mm -hmm. and say, what did Lila know? <laughs> um, for me as a writer, I, I, I sort of know where I'm starting. I don't know how it's going to go. Um, I, I, for me, it's a discovery all the way to the end. So <clears throat> I am not Lila, but like Lila, I found out something at the end of this, writing this novel in which I would never be the same person again. And I'll give you, explain that to you. <clears throat> uh, last week, I happened to look on PBS, and they were doing a documentary on Julia Childs. So they went back to the beginning, how she started. And she actually, during World War II, she worked in the um, 
in, in the war as one of the women workers. And she explained that she got her break because when her, fa when her husband moved to Paris and she with him, um, the American embassy was doing something for GI veterans. And that since she had worked, since she was a veteran, it, 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 you know, she was there. So she's talking about, this is in the Cordon Bleu, and she talks about, I was the only woman. And with my Lila, now that Lila knows, I notice that there were no black people. That surrounding around her, I am just looking at this. This is in the early 50s. What a break it would have been for any person. I'm sure of those men who were around her went on to be chefs somewhere. And she was talking about this was the break she got as a woman. And so that's what Lila knows. Um, Lila cannot look, and Elizabeth cannot look at situations just the same. That I've always loved Julia Childs, I'd followed Julia Childs, and that was it. I said, you know, she didn't even notice. But I noticed. Mm -hmm. So opportunity. Opportunity and what happens when it opens up for some and not for others. And in the context of this particular story, this is a Caribbean, Caribbean writer, a Caribbean woman, professor, mm -hmm. who comes uh, to the United States mm -hmm. and is given an opportunity mm -hmm. that her uh, black counterparts in America are not allowed. I think you're rushing to the end there. Okay, I when thought she, we were there. I thought you're we were rushing there. to the end when she comes to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She doesn't come with that understanding. No, she doesn't. She comes with the understanding that most immigrants, I will not say every, but most immigrants come to this country to, for an opportunity for themselves. Mm -hmm. Not for America, not from any ethnic group, not for any organization, but for their individual development. And the most that they'll be concerned about is the family back home. So I'm going to send money back home. I'm concerned about back home. I'm looking at America in the same way that you can look at America on TV. This is the land of milk and honey. If you work hard, if you do this, you do that, whatever, right? No investment. And I'm a little tired of that. Um, and so this novel focuses on, base, puts the light on just really two groups of people. A Caribbean immigrant who is black and African Americans. Now, I start off that novel by the question of silence. Mm -hmm. Do we have an obligation to speak when we see injustice? Do we have it? Uh, Martin Luther King has told us that that is the worst thing that could happen, when good men say nothing. And Eileen Wiesel, who is also in the epigraph to the novel, says the same thing, talks about when you see injustice um, and you remain silent, then you are part of a tragedy. You are part of the problem. Well, an immigrant doesn't, what's, why should I get involved? Mm. It's not my business. So um, this is what Lila has to learn. Um, she sees something. And do you mind if I read the first paragraph? Please. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the first paragraph is what she sees. She's now arrived in um, just off the plane. On the day Lila Bonard arrived in America to begin teaching at Mayfield College, named for the eponymous small town in a bucolic area of Vermont, there was a killing. Some said it was an accidental killing. They claimed the man who lay on the sidewalk of Main Street, Main, Main Street bleeding from gunshot wounds to his head and chest, just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. The few who knew the secrets to the man's heart disagreed. The dead man was in the right place at the right time. It was his reason for being there that was wrong. But there were other people, though only three, who eschewed all excuses and explanations. The man was murdered in cold blood, they said. 
there could be no other way to spin his senseless death. So that's what Lila sees. Mm -hmm. And everybody has a reason, an yeah. explanation. So it's a really strong opening. It's a strong way for her to come into America, and it's a really strong opening for, for the book. And of course, we know how timely you know, the, mm -hmm. the issue is. You write about humanity and who gets to decide who has humanity, who's given the rights that go along with being mm -hmm. a human being, and who, who doesn't. I like the reference to King and, of course, the Wiesel quote as well. Mm -hmm. You know, neither of those quotes are they talking about humanity being afforded to a particular people, no. right? It's, it's a general yeah. statement that we attach to anyone who is, who is mm -hmm. living and breathing. So in this story, can you talk a little bit about what keeps Lila from seeing this as a human issue? as opposed to an American issue? Well, yes, Lila is aghast. If you came, you just got off the plane and as you're driving to where you're going to, to, to teach, you see this man bleed, bleeding on the, on the ground. And so from that point of view, she is, you know, this is horrible. But it's not horrible enough for her to do something about it. And of course, to do something about it is to go to the police and tell them what she saw. Because she actually had gotten out of the taxi because there was such a lineup, um, you know, such a, a traffic jam, that she had actually gotten out of the taxi and she was walking to where she was going to stay. And so she saw when that man was shot by the police. She actually saw it. Um, so from a human level, yes, that's a horrible thing to see. Now, do you make the next step and identify on a human level mm. that I have now a responsibility, that I should go to the police and tell them, uh, you know, report, what I, should I be a witness? Well, it's very convenient for us to say, well, it's not my business. It's not my business. And she's helped. She has a fiancé who tells her when she tells the fiance, the fiance is still on the island, and she tells the fiance, and he says, that's American business, you stay out of that. Mm -hmm. Don't have anything to do with it. Let me say that this is all fiction, um, but when you read the book, you will see that you will recognize some of the instances. And let me tell you about that particular instance when I started the novel. I read about this maybe 15 years ago, before police brutality, anybody was talking about it. And I read about this distinguished black man who had come upon this white woman who was ODing from drugs. And he, he tried to give her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to bring her back. And the police saw him doing that. And they warned him to get off the woman. And in his mind, it wasn't a white woman. It was somebody in peril. So he was continuing to give her mouth to mouth. And they shot him dead. Now, the, that, all, that story just always registered in my mind, one, how horrible it was. But two, that I never read anything about it. I never heard anybody talking about it. I never saw it in the newspaper. I began to wonder, did, did I really hear this story? Did this really happen? And of course, it did happen. And as you know, the things that have happened lately have just made it more and more likely that it happened. So I began this novel with that incident as I imagined it. Um, yeah, there's something, I, I very much, you know, in all my novels, I'm, I'm really talking about the human condition. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about our commonality. Um, and and I, I want my readers, 
even if my characters are Caribbean or my characters are African American or whatever, I want them to see themselves in those characters. I want them to identify with those um, people. So in a way, you can identify with Lila. If you could be a Polish immigrant. You could be a Russian immigrant. You could be a Korean immigrant. Yeah, it's not none of my business. I saw it, but you know, it's terrible. It shouldn't happen. But, but do you have a responsibility? And in fact, there are a number of characters in the book who answer that question differently, right? There are some, like you mentioned, Robert, who says, none of your business. Yeah. There are those at the university who also say, this is none, none yeah. of your business. This is our business. We'll take care of it. And there, of course, are characters who, um, in some respect, want to hold Lila accountable for the silence that, that you talked about. And so I think it's a wonderful way to demonstrate how complex the situations are, but also, you know, we as, as people, we don't all agree. Well, we, we find a lot of reasons not to get involved. Um, let me give a little bit of the setting, which probably could identify with when I first came here. Um, I went to college in Wisconsin. It was an all-white institution. There were four people of color. We were all foreigners. Um, so in a sense, we had no investment. The whole town, there were no people of color in that town. And so a lot of the reason, the reasons people have to say it's none of my business, I'm getting from that experience and similar experience. So some of the people in the college that I made up in Vermont say, well, the guy was a gadfly. Mm. The black guy was, he was always a troublemaker, kind of a gadfly. When the police told him to get off that woman, that's the kind of guy. He always used to object to everything. So if I think that way, I'm okay. You know, it's all right. He didn't listen to the police, but that's the way he operated anyhow. Then there were another people who said, well, would you have, suppose he had a gun. You don't know if he had a gun. Would you have taken that chance? Crystal, again, I'm watching TV in a different way mm -hmm. than I ever do. And I was just looking at one, some detective show, I mean, a real life one, in which these two people murdered two women in cold blood. So they knew, they knew who the, the murderers were. This is one of those detective mm -hmm. real shows, documentaries that they show. Anyhow, the police followed the two murderers and found them. And they waited as they were coming out of their houses. And do you know what these four policemen do? Oh, there were more than four. They stunned them. Mm. They stunned the man and they stunned the woman. So the man and the woman fell on the ground. And then they handcuffed them. Sure. So this is now Lila knows. I, I, I mean, I'm just seeing the world in a different way. Right. I'm sure if last year I looked at that, I wouldn't have noticed that that is the way you could apprehend people. You could stun them. Nobody in that documentary talked about, they just talked about where we captured the murderers. Right. Elizabeth is saying, well, if that, those murderers were black, they wouldn't have been handcuffed. They'd be dead. Right, right. So there's another way to capture somebody. So this whole program was showing how they followed these people and they knew where they were and they stunned them. Right. I mean, so I, my eyes are gone <laughs> from, yeah. from writing. Um, I mean, this is just like uh, Julia Childs and then this other one was the week before. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at mm -hmm. it. And we, we see it all the time. I think one of the most powerful comments, and there were so many um, that came out of the George Floyd protests was, you know, we want you to not kill us like you don't kill them. Right? That is the point that yes, you're making, that yeah. there are people who may be committing crimes, but the sentence is, is not the death penalty. And the way it's handled is something that we have to, we have to deal with, which tracks back to the lack of seeing people as 
as human beings. Oh, what a thing, what a thing. And then, you know, I also in this novel, as Lila is beginning to understand what's going on, she hears people, I, I do a situation of that, you remember that little boy, 12 years old, who was killed? Tamir Rice. Yes, yes. with the gun, mm -hmm. with the toy gun. And so I imagine it, I take her into grocery stores where people have, they have to find a way to deal with it. You can't have the police kill a 12 year old boy and not find a way to deal with your conscience. That is the problem. So she overhears how they deal with it. And they say, well, his mother wasn't looking after him. I mean, what was a 12 year old boy doing out of his neighborhood in a park? And then they say, but how were they to know? The toy guns look like a real gun. You have to find a way to deal with it. And this is what is happening to Lila. She is constantly finding a way to deal with that she doesn't have to be a witness. And the two other African-American professors in that all-white college, they don't tell her. They don't say to her, you should do it. They expect her to do it, but they're not pushing her. They're waiting to see what she's going to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to attribute that, um, Crystal, to something I very much admire about African Americans. Mm. I can't get over it. I just can't get over the more I look at the history of African-Americans, and the more I see what African-Americans have gone through, I can't get over the fact that African-Americans don't keep pointing their fingers and saying, you have to do something. So my two professors mm -hmm. don't do anything. They're just waiting for Lila to become a human being. They're waiting for Lila to, um, to see what's around her, and therefore seeing what's around her, to do something. Fortunately, she does. She does, <laughs> she does, she does. I wanna talk a little bit about the students on campus and oh, yeah. tie uh, the wonderful way that you write about the way they interact with the situation to students in our, in our world today, right? This, this new generation and how these issues um, how they deal with the, the, the issues that are either on the media or in their everyday lived experiences? Well, believe it or not, I'm still teaching. <laughs> I teach at Hunter College. And my son says to me that I'm, I go through like Groundhog Day because <laughs> every semester I have a whole crop of young people. You know, they never get old. <laughs> They're always between 18 and 20 something. I have one or two maybe older. But the students I teach never get old. And they always bring these, I mean, I just feel I only wanted to do two things in life, to teach and to write. And I thank God that those are the two things I'm doing. Because I have learned so much from writing, but I have learned so much from teaching. And if I have one moment of feeling down, I can tell you these young people are amazing. They are not, and this is not gonna sound too good for my generation, they're not like the six days beatniks, the flower people, you know, running through this thing and singing <laughs> songs and whatever, and once they got the job and the Vietnam War was over, they went to Wall Street. <laughs> That's what happened. And if you were stupid enough like me <laughs> to feel this beatnik thing was all kumbaya, you're crazy. You missed it. Because yeah. the, <laughs> the war was over, everybody went back to their jobs. And these young people are not like that. They are not like that. They're putting their bodies where their mouths are. And it's, I just see the growth every semester. And I happen to teach courses that would allow me to see it. Um, one of them is creative writing fiction. And then I teach a literature course of, on women writers. And I could see their responses, um, so nuanced. And sometimes they, I get out of line and they pull me back. Mm -hmm. um, 
I remember um, reading a story by a, uh, uh, in, in the course by a writer, a Jamaican writer that I admired so much. I, I won't say her name because this isn't going to end up too well. <laughs> um, but she was writing about this young girl, this man who has co come back to renew his relationship with this young girl. And I'm in love with the story because the man is saying how much he loves the girl, how he kisses every piece of her body, how she's the most wonderful. And a student got up and said to me, Professor, you are wrong. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I just won't forget this student standing up telling me, you are wrong. She said what that man did, he was an older man, and he took that girl when she was in her school uniform, and I don't care what he did with her later on, and gave her an apartment and two children. He ruined her life from that moment. And I was romanticizing it. I said, the man came back for the woman. <laughs> he came back for the girl. He's so in love. He wants to take her on vacation and everything. And they weren't having it. So um, my students, are, I, if, if you for one moment feel that things are going to the dogs, as you probably sometimes feel, as we are hopefully not going to feel on Thursday, when they air this hearing, um, believe you me, there's a crop of young people, black, white, Asian, who are not playing. And we have to thank ourselves for that because we raise them. Mm -hmm. We raise them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about the, how about academia? I was going to, to yeah. ask about one of the specific professors in the book, but you're really painting a picture, mm -hmm. you know, of, of a world, of an industry that performs a certain way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we certainly see a lot of examples um, mm -hmm. of that in the novel. Mm -hmm. How responsive is higher education to the young people that you are describing, or even to the world that we all know we are, are, are living in with all of its changes? Well, I've been in higher education, and I'll just tell you how long, since 1972, I have been a, a professor at the City University of New York. And I can say that diversity is a code word and it's a useful word. And one more time, I'm saying that the young people do not interpret diversity in the way the administrators of higher education interpret that word. Mm. They are looking for slots. We have to have so many women, so many blacks, so many Asians, so many. They're looking for slots. They don't understand. They're not willing to, um, to do the hard work. Mm that is diversity. And I suppose, yeah, it's slow and it's hard work. And they feel satisfied when they could count the numbers. And that's not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful moment, I won't give away too much, but there's a wonderful moment when Lila um, objects, let's just say, mm -hmm. you know, to the uh, establishment and what it wants from from her, and I think it was powerful, I think it was bold, mm -hmm. and I think you're absolutely right. We have, it was reflective of sort of a change in society that mm -hmm. we need to, mm -hmm. to, see, to see more of. Yeah, um, we have to be careful about those code words, and we have to be careful about being satisfied when we have checked the boxes. Um, and I've been so long, <laughs> I, I try not to talk in department meetings. I, I keep my mouth shut. But I hear things like, we have to have an opportunity hire. Well, I went nuts when I heard that. And they didn't understand why I was going nuts. Now, if you have to have an opportunity hire, and this is happening in higher education all over the place, everywhere. It, uh, opportunity hire, what's that a code word for? You know what's the code word for. <laughs> opportunity hire is not to give an opportunity to a white faculty member. That is not the thing. So you hire this, you have this opportunity hire, and these people get hired. 
And um, how do you think they feel? Right. So I am lucky. I think one of the, and you have done it too, Crystal. Um, I think one of the smartest thing I did was getting a PhD when I was fairly young. I was 30 or 31 when I was having my son somewhere there. That was the smartest thing I did. And the, the next smartest thing I did is because I didn't believe that there, that there was an opportunity <laughs> for me to publish, I was doing a lot of academic work, meaning I was writing scholarly articles for scholarly journals and so on. So I moved up the ranks. I make sure in the institution that I am in that I, yes, I am a novelist, but I am a professor. And I am professor because I did all the things you did to become a professor. I, I did research. I published in scholarly articles. Now what I'm doing is writing novels. Someone asked me, I just did an interview, um, and someone mentioned in the interview, you know, you always have all these writers and these quotes in your story. I said, yeah, because that's what I did. <laughs> that, that was my background. So to get back to the opportunity hire, why is it I have to now be in an institution where I feel, and I do say that mm -hmm. at one point in the novel, where I feel I have to throw out my credentials at you? Because you think that the only reason I'm there it's because of the color of my skin. Why is it I have to do that? And you're making it worse by naming the thing an opportunity hire. You are going to tell me you cannot find a, a black faculty, an Asian faculty. You just have to work harder. And maybe you have to offer them a little more money and a little more perks, but you can do it. So um, I don't think the young people are putting up with that nonsense mm -hmm. because they can read right through you. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say an instance, um, I was teaching, I, I think, the, the creative writing class. And I, I had, I, in my younger days, and to some degree, I do memorize lines. So I know the opening lines of Homer's Iliad. So I'm sitting in this class, and I quote, for some reason, I quote the first few lines of the Iliad. And this student gets up and says that she thinks I'm wrong. Now, I was in total shock, you know? I mean, I'm a professor. For a student to say in the class, professor, I think you've got that wrong, is a shock. You know, you, even if you think so, you will do that later on. You wouldn't do that in a class. And I have to say, I can just see him now, this tall, white, male student, just a beautiful guy, just got up and started punching his machine. And when he punched it, he then read the lines, and he said, the professor is right. Now, what made that woman do that? What made that student do that? Right. First, she was rude. Right. Second, she was challenging me. And third, if she thought I was wrong, she should have punched just like that guy did to find out if I'm right or wrong. But he got it. That class remained silent. And this, now what I will say is she wasn't American. She was a student from Italy. She was young, in her early 20s, and she had the goal when she returned to Italy to ask me if I would continue to be a mentor for her work. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But that, you see, that's what I was trying to say in this. this and and yeah. you, you do it. You yeah. have an example of a, of a, of a challenge moment, right? Yeah. A challenge moment where you, the class opens up. Mm -hmm. And there are people who want to, instead of engaging with this professor, this doctor of, of literature, talk about Bob Marley yeah. and Rihanna. Yeah. Right? And so to instantly kind of take, take the... It down. Take it down. Take it down. This class is about one thing, and we love you know, the musical geniuses that are Bob Marley and Rihanna, but the class is one in, 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 in literature. And so that sort of 
uh, way of reacting to Lila in the story, right? This idea that I can only interact with this professor where I am and not where, mm -hmm. you know, where, where, where she clearly, clearly is. I love, um, I love the way you reference other work in your work. Sometimes you do it directly, and other times, you know, you've got to be pretty well read to pick up on some of the references that, that you're making. But I think it adds such a wonderful depth to, to your writing. So The Tempest oh, yeah. and Caliban. I know. Um, <laughs> Number one, your work and others, <laughs> you know, get a, a little bit of light in, in this novel. And I think it's wonderful. And I would love it if you could just talk a little bit about um, what it means to tell a story through someone else's eyes. And you play around in the novel with yeah. whose eyes are Point being privileged. In. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, I hope I remember what you asked because my head was yeah. spinning it this way. Um, I do that deliberately. Um, I, I, I hopefully do it organically. I, it doesn't seem like I just find a way to mention an author in my book. But I notice the English writers do it. If you read any of the English writers, um, I think I need a tissue. A tissue. I think I have one yeah. in my bag. I should have thought of that. Um, I can't find one. Oh, you have one, okay. Yeah. The English writers do that. And I've been noticing them doing it over and over. There's a particular, well, he, I guess he's South African and English, um, GM could see him. Um, who won the Nobel Prize, disgraces the novel I like to teach. But I read these novels over and over again. And I notice that they pepper their novels with their, um, I've just finished reading for the third time, well, he's Irish, John Banville's uh, The Sea, which I love, love, love. And they pepper their works with other writers. Why do you think they're doing that? That's how they keep their writers alive. That's how they make their writers classics. That's how they keep their writers in their conversation. So the writer is writing for herself or for himself, but if they can organically put in other writers, you have to see those writers. So in this novel, she's a teacher. What is she going to teach? Merle Hodges' Crick Crack Monkey, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it's not crick crack monkey, it's just crick crack. Um, so she doesn't only teach it, but I'm going to have the students make some kind of response. What do I want the reader to do? To say, well, who is this writer? Mm -hmm. So I'm not killing Merle Hodge. And the English writers do that, and we have to start to do that. Mm -hmm. So what book does she bring, um, Lila? She brings Derek Walcott's Omarus. Right. Does she just say, I just brought Der Derek Walcott's Omarus? She tells us how challenging it is to write 800, I think it's 800 lines of iambic pentameter he had. She tells us how, and there's some discussion here mm -hmm. about the content of Omarus. So it depends on. You know, she's a professor, so I have the chance to do that in her classes. But I am pulling in these writers so that you don't forget them, so that you read them. Mm -hmm. Now, you were asking me about point of view in The Tempest. So I grew up in Trinidad when Trinidad was a colony. I had a British education, totally British education, though in Trinidad. And so when we read The Tempest, the point of view we were exposed to is Prospero's point of view. But Prospero came to an island that looks like mine, and Prospero tells, decides in a very short space of time, he imprisons Caliban, makes him his slave, calls, says to him that um, stripes may move you, not kindness. And you know what stripes are? Mm -hmm. We got nine tails. Stripes may move you, not kindness. No time to waste on you. Mm -hmm. 
says, I tried to teach you, but your brain was incapable of taking it. I'm sitting in the class, and I'm looking at somebody like me. And then Prosper says the most outrageous thing, you can't, you're not even grateful. Well, I guess I should be grateful. I'm in a colony. You know, I know it's my island, but you're the guys who are educating me. I need to be grateful. So if you keep that point of view, you're OK. Now switch the point of view, which I did in Prospero's Daughter, and I mentioned here. And it's easy to switch the point of view. You know why? Because he has a secret. Shakespeare gives his most lyrical lines to the characters he most admires. So if you're reading a Shakespeare play and you're falling in love with these lines, you know these are, char these are characters Shakespeare is closest to. Take Hamlet, for example. The lyrical lines in Hamlet is Hamlet. Who's, who's speaking in prose? Mm -hmm. Rosencrantz and Gilderstone. Rosencrantz and Dis Gilderstone were Hamlet's good buddies, but they were carrying a letter so that when Hamlet arrives, he is going to be killed. They're traitors. When they start speaking, they're speaking in prose. Shakespeare doesn't have time to give them these lyrical lines. Yeah. When you get to the Tempest, who has the lyrical lines? Be not afraid. This isle is full of noises, songs, and whatever. Yes. That bring, give the light. You know, you know those lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are the most gorgeous lines. Who is saying that? Caliban. And then you say to yourself, I wonder why Shakespeare did that. And then when you read those lines carefully, what you understand is he's talking about perspective. Because the reason Caliban said those lines is because Trinculo and Stefano, who, who are the Italian ship, ship, sailors, gets in this forest and they say, oh my god, they're so scared. And Caliban says, be not afraid. He's saying them, the noise you're hearing are oh, sounds of a, a I wish, I, 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 I know it by heart, but yeah. it's just that I'm not saying it. But he's talking, about, he's talking about the kind of noises you hear in the forest, right. which are wonderful noises. The crackling of the twigs, the birds flying, the feathers, perspective. That's what's in that line. That's what is happening. And all the teachers I had, all through graduate school, all through my PhD, you think they noticed that? Mm. It was right in your face. Right. And who is the people who are saying that this is a bad place? The sailors. Not the royalty, the regular sailors who are saying, you know, I'm scared. Yeah. So just change the perspective. And Caliban is saying, that I slept to dream again. I wish I could wake to dream again for this wonderful thing. Now, what I did in that novel was something that kind of not so nice. Mm -hmm. The not so nice thing I did was that I happened to be in my living room when the 2012 Olympics in London happened. And on this hill were these Englishmen in black frock coats and black hats. What were they saying? Be not afraid. This isle is full of noises. What isle are you talking about? That's me on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> what, what isle are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So you do something really wonderful. Um, we are watching Lila develop and grow mm -hmm. and come to know. But she also comes knowing what you just described, right? What it is to. She knows that part. She knows that part. She knows, she that, knows part. that part, and she uses it to build a bridge between mm -hmm. what she notices is happening, you know, in the on the college campus mm -hmm. with um, black and white racial strife in this country, mm -hmm. her understanding of herself as a Caribbean immigrant um, who's working alongside black colleagues, and so she's. She's, she's using this, and she's understanding that people want something, right? In the same way that she knows as a writer, as a reader, as a professor of this work, 
there's a thing that you want to get out of it and you don't want to be in a world where it gets overlooked, right? Um, and she understands, I don't want to give too much away, that her counterparts in the college, they want something very, very specific as well. Well, one more time, it's the students who bring her to this awareness. Mm -hmm. um, because when she goes to the cafeteria, this, these, they're all white students, but there's this banner that says Black Lives Matter. And they identify her as black. And she has not seen herself in that identification. Mm -hmm. So um, the students, I have such hope with young people. I, I, I really think, and it's as my son says, Groundhog's Day, I see them all the time. I see them every semester. And I see them getting better and better. I, I, you know, um, and, and although this COVID thing was horrible, the Zoom allowed me to have like our, an hour conference with each of my students um, on Zoom. So I got to know them in deeper ways. So um, yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm lost, lost your question, okay. um, Crystal. Okay. But um, yeah, she, she knows, she understands that. And she has to negotiate her way with these academics mm -hmm. that she knows have a different perspective. But I also bring in James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm throwing writers into the story. And France Fanon. I bring France Fanon. Fanon. Yeah. I bring Baldwin in a way that um, helps to calm the waters. Because, um, well, you have to read that. Yeah, you have to read <laughs> I think we have to open up to questions from the, the audience. Um, so if you have a question, um, raise your hand and Destiny will come to you. And to our Zoom audience, you can add questions in the Q&A. Good evening. Um, I'm so thankful to be here and to have observed and listened to, your, um, to this conversation. I, I just have a question. As an immigrant myself, as a Caribbean immigrant myself, um, one of the um, things that I've noticed and I would love for you to comment on is once you've migrated, there's no re way really for you to separate from the struggle because you are receiving, you're, you're a recipient of it. For example, your experience with this, the student who questioned you, um, when, who questioned whether you had memorized the, 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 the lines properly. So how do you, um, how do you um, reconcile the fact that once we've immigrated, we are, we are thrust into the society where we can't separate from the struggle. And what you've described before, that once we come here, we have this kind of laser focus on building what we consider the American dream, which is probably the thing that we've migrated to achieve. Um, but along that path to achieving the American dream, you can't really separate from the struggle because it hits you in the face. Um, as an immigrant, as, an, as a minority in any respect. Um, so if you can comment on that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think you can separate yourself from it. I think too many immigrants separate themselves from it. That even though they are affected by it, they can, in fact, separate themselves from it. They can go back into their communities, into their silos, and be with each other, and eat the same food, and listen to the same music, go back on home on visits, and eventually immigrate there. I mean, retire there. So you can separate from it. You have some kinds of options. I'm not saying it's not affecting you. Um, African Americans can't do that. That's the first thing I'm saying. And the second thing I'm saying is immigrants owe African Americans. And they can't do that. They have to, 
and let me just say, I'm not saying this as though I just woke up and um, came to this realization. I have been beaten <laughs> good and properly <laughs> because I certainly didn't start off by saying that. Um, I have been made to, and I don't, I think I've, if I have to fault African Americans, I would say they don't let us know their history. They don't, they don't, I think when you try to be, when you come to be a citizen, part of the citizenship is this lesson about African Americans, this lesson about America's original sin. I think you have to know it. Whether you're Korean or Indian or you come from Africa or you're from, from Caribbean, you have to know it. Because if you do not know it, you can just look at what's happening now as something that is just happening now. And you do not understand that it has historical depth. And you do not understand that your presence here is due to that struggle. Let me make myself very clear. And I am not trying to get points at any point except to tell you um, I started at Medgavers for many years, and they sure beat me up. They sure beat me, because, you know, it, that's your trouble. That's not my trouble. You go work out your trouble. I'm going to teach my classes and go home, and everything's so hokey-dory, you know? But there's a simple number that I seem to feel that most people miss. And that number is 1964. And 1965. Anybody knows why I'm saying those two dates? What is 1964 and 1965? Immigration. 64, what happened in 64? What happened in 65? Immigration. What was the Immigration Act changed? Country of origin was no longer a criterion for immigration. Do you understand the connection? Before that, country of origin was criteria for immigrating. And you know how that went. Just Google it. And you will know that there was a quota for every place. Northern Europeans had a huge quota, hundreds of thousands. All of Africa had something like 2,500 people in the whole African continent. India had a little group, and a little group, and a little group. So when you see immigrants of color in this country, you do a little mathematics, and you won't go any further than 1965. You may go further than 1965, but you will find them in certain positions. Right? So you have to make that connection. And I I write it in my stories, and I just feel it needs to be said. It needs to be, OK, I'm watching a little too much TV, so I'm going to tell you another TV show I just saw. <laughs> I tell my students that all the time. And they say, Professor, what else do you do? I said, because I go to sleep at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and at 8 o'clock, I turn on the TV, and I watch for an hour, whatever is coming on there. And I can't stand the stupid TV, so I'm looking at documents. So there was something on Gregory. Dick Gregory. Mm -hmm. I remember when I came to Medgavers, Dick Gregory came to Medgavers. Did I know who he was? Did I care who he was? He was a little comedian. Did I, I was teaching at Medgavers. Did I care that the college was called Medgavers? Nobody told me. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me that I was teaching, that I got a job, to, I got an opportunity to teach in an institution where somebody was assassinated for registering people to vote. And nobody told me that Dick Gregory wasn't a comedian coming to Medgavers and I'm clapping, but all that he did, that he gave up a lucrative career to join um, Martin Luther King in this struggle. So I'm telling you, after re writing now Lila Lewis, I can't watch TV anymore. But I knew that before that, I have to tell you that. But what I'm to answer your question is that we have to accept that. We have to understand that. 
And then we have to ask the question, what can we, we have an obligation. What can we do to move that needle? And I just want to say one more thing, which is in that novel, which my agent made me cut half of it out, but it, part of it is still in the novel. Not Johnny, Johnny wouldn't have had me cut that out. <laughs> I wrote that if you look at Amadou Diallo and what is the um, from yeah no the the the, the Abner Louima Abner Louima neither of them were Americans they were both immigrants who came out African Americans the thing that shocked me that I wrote in this novel because I was so shocked watching TV uh, okay I watch TV. But I read too. I read, I read every day. <laughs> I read every day. But I watch a lot of TV. Coming from Trinidad, to see a mayor, David Dinkins, standing in front of the police precinct, handcuffed, I thought this was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. That somebody of that stature would get himself arrested and handcuffed. For, for somebody who was not an American, was an immigrant. That is my answer to your question. Because if anything happens, any kind of injustice, except for this most recent one, which was really great for my art to see the outpouring of people, um, African Americans come out. And we have one more question from Zoom, um, or time for one more question, rather. Uh, and I do have something to say in the end. <laughs> you want to say it now or after this question? Whichever works for you. <laughs> OK, let me say it now in case I forget. Viola Davis just had a biography, mm -hmm. which I read on the plea. And in it, she says, there is the talent, and there are the seats filling the seats. And a lot of people don't make the connection. They were asking her, how come it took you so long to get to you know, stardom? And she said, because there's the talent and there's filling the seat. So I'm making a, a case for what you. I'm asking the audience to recognize that, OK, I have a job, right, that pays my rent and everything else. But I know that you keep writers alive by filling the seats. And filling the seats is buying their books. Nice. So our final question is from Clarence Reynolds. Hello, Elizabeth. It's good to see you. How important is it for writers of the African diaspora to take a risk in addressing obligations about right and wrong in their work? I, I, did you understand the question? How important is it for writers to ad address risk in their work? Uh, to take risk in addressing obligations about right and wrong in their work. To take risk in writing. In addressing obligations about right and wrong in their work for about writers of right the African diaspora. Wrong. Well, you have to have a publisher like Akashic Books. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have to have a, a, a publisher like Johnny Temple who takes that kind of risk. And I will say this. You know the book that was a phenomenon last year, or the year before. Are you sure you all read it, Where the Crawdads Sing? Yes. Mm. Do you realize what that novel was about? It was about justified murder, and everybody ate it up without realizing it. Mm. That's risk. But that's risk put in a basket that is acceptable. That novel that sold 20 million things. Everybody you ask about that, oh, I was mesmerized, the best novel. I said, but do you realize that novel is about justified murder? Do you realize that? Is murder ever justified? Is murder ever justified? That's what that novel was. So um, it's, it's publishers to me thinking that the reader is not smart enough to figure out stuff. So they make it palatable and work the mm. plot. And you have to be lucky enough, as I feel I am, to have a publisher that says, well, this is what you think, and this is what you say. 
And so long as the writing is good, I'm not saying he's going to take my writing if it's not good. <laughs> um, and did I spoil where the crawdads sing for you? You didn't spoil it. <laughs> no, no. OK. All right, let's give everybody, let's give them a hand. Yeah. Thank you both so much. And uh, you probably don't know this, but I, because I just found out today, but uh, Elizabeth was a board member at the Center for Fiction for yes. 10 years okay. when it was still the Mercantile Library transitioning yeah. over. So, um, so we're really grateful to have her here in our new space. And we're grateful for our, the Brooklyn Caribbean Literary Festival and for all of you for coming. And so go on over to the bookstore and buy a book and come back and um, Elizabeth will personalize it for you. I'm Thanks. signing here. Well, yeah, we'll set you up at a table here. So you guys better come here. That's right. <laughs> Go quickly and come back here. <laughs>